you need help. You need to get things off your plate and become the leader, the entrepreneur in your business and stop being the technician. If they don't get that separation, that gap, you'll never get to a million. Welcome to 7 to 8, our special series on 7 and 8 figure speakers. In this interview series, some of the hottest speakers in the industry who made over seven figures in a year or less will uncover their twists and turns in their adventures, helping you to avoid the potholes and stick to the fast track. Welcome now to Center Stage, our next guest speaker. Hey there, peeps. This is Michelle Nedelec, and I am super glad that you're here with us today because today I am here with my most amazing guest, Steve. Coach Steve, how you doing? Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you for having me. <laughs> awesome. So give us a quick introduction of who you are and what you love to do. Yeah, I am Biz Coach Steve Feld. I've actually owned and operated seven businesses and ran three others. I love business and anything that happens with business. And nowadays, I'm a business marketing strategist. I have my own podcast, author and copy enthusiast. And got my first TEDx done, so I'm happy on that. Yes. Congratulations! I saw that. I was like, "Yay, you did it! That's fantastic!" It I love is. that you said your first TED talk. <laughs> my first. There will be more, and and definitely a coffee enthusiast because I even have my own brand of coffee. I am that serious about coffee, but I primarily work with owner operators, helping them crack that multiple six figures and seven figures without burning themselves out and helping them build a long-term sustainable business that one day they can actually sell or get rid of, not die in or close the doors. That just makes it so sad. It's just not right. So awesome. So tell us, let's back up the bus bit. And how did you get into business as a thing? How did it become kind of your passion? Well, it all started when I was a little boy. <laughs> <laughs> it actually did. I was that kid in school. We always have that kid, right, that does certain things. I was the kid selling soda and chips out of the locker in the hall. Nice. And then, you know, I got busted a few times, but I'm an entrepreneur. So, you know, junior high comes rolling around. Hmm. Term papers. Then college hit. And then I found a bigger market. Yeah, bigger term papers, test results. I was that guy who knew a guy, right? I was ah. it. And that's how I put my, one of the ways I put myself through college was selling things. <laughs> Maybe not the right way, but it <laughs> made me provided revenue. Put me through college. <laughs> and I bet there's a lot of PhDs out there that really appreciate that kickstart in college. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this is pre-internet, so there was no social media to really find out. You couldn't Google to see if I was, if it was, you know, plagiarized or not. So you no, know, it, it makes it handy. And 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 I heard a great quote the other day. It said, "Uh, cheating is the mainstay of entrepreneurialness. It's like surround yourself with people that are better, smarter than you, and just you take go. their stuff." <laughs> it's like it it's not really taking their stuff so much as it is you know paying them for their stuff which right. of course you did <laughs> i did and you know nowadays it's r and d and that's rip off and duplicate because right. <laughs> oh that's happening a lot but you know it, it really started always having that spirit and i my any job i had they kind of left me to de develop a you know, division for them or create something and I never felt like an employee because they're like just give Steve the tools and let him make us a lot of money and I made a lot of money during that way and I was traveling around with musical acts and I came up with some processes and it started saving our company a million a year Same. next thing you know venues from all over the world were like watching me put it in process and that's saving them money and headache and frustration then they would hire me. So here I am trying to travel around the world with musical acts. And then when I have time off on my days off, I'm actually on the phone doing consulting work. Nice. And then I was like, you know, I'm getting tired of traveling the world. I know it sounds horrible, but it is work. And I said, I'm going to start up my first business. And I wrote, started writing business and marketing plans for tech startups. And business was booming because I was part of that tech bubble. And it burst and well, so did my business. 
That was it. I, yep. <laughs> I totally <laughs> get that one. So now you're doing the coaching and helping people is, is, and then talk to me about that seven figure thing. Cause a lot of people go, okay, want to make a million dollars in business. And they pick it kind of randomly because you know, it's a nice round number and, and whatnot. Are there any problems associated with picking, you know, a million dollars in revenue as their target? I believe there is because there are a lot of businesses pick that, you know, elusive number because it sounds good, but let's do, we get into the math of it. And are they the kind of business owner that's willing to let go of things in their business? And you have those business owners, I want to create a million dollar business, but I'm going to do it. It's like, you know, there's not said no one ever who can create a million dollar business by themselves. It can, can it happen? Sure. It's called day trading and all that weird stuff, but I'm talking a legit business. You need help. You need to get things off your plate and become the leader, the entrepreneur in your business and stop being the technician. If they don't get that separation, that gap, you'll never get to a million. And then there also has to be more than why is it a million? And I tried to get into the why of it. What do you want to do? Do you want to retire? Let's look at retirement. Let's talk about retirement right now. Well, I'm only like two years, three years in my business. We're talking about retirement. How much money will you need every year to live on retirement? Where do you want to live? Now let's add that up. So you're talking a million a year. Just your retirement plan is 5 million. So you think you're going to sell your business at five times gross revenue, which is that won't happen. I'm telling you that it might in very rare situations, but you're actually undercutting yourself. And let's start developing milestones to get some wins in there and work on a final goal. Because how do you know where you're going to go if you don't have a goal? And I see that with a lot of business owners. They say, I like to make, I want to make a million. Great. What's your plan to get there? Uh, work harder, sell more stuff. That's their plan. <laughs> let's come up with a plan of action and take action. You know, let's do it and go there but we have to measure it along the way because we need to have some real goals of where we want to go not just a million bucks well and i see that too that a lot of people don't then break down that goal so what are some of the things that you want to be looking for when you're breaking that goal down in order to make it an achievable goal yeah i can say you can't eat the elephant in one bite same thing with a million dollars if you're doing a hundred thousand even 200,000 now to get to a million is a jump. That's, you know, 10 times or five times in your business. That is huge. And if it's only you doing it and you're burning the candle at both ends, 80 hours a week and your spouse or whoever else in your life is hating you because you're working all the time, we have to break it down on how are you going to start hiring people? When, at what stage, who is the first person to hire? And I hear this all the time. They always go, I want to hire an assistant right away. That's an expense position. We need a revenue position. We got to duplicate your sales ability. That doubles the revenue. Will they be as good as you? No. But we need to go for revenue positions first, whereas a lot of business owners think, I'm going to hire someone to do all of my admin. There's VAs. There's outsourcing companies. Let's go that route. That's going to be even cheaper for you, much more, more economical. It'll save you the time. And right now, you need to focus on growing. So we got to break it down in chunks, personnel-wise, your marketing. Who's really your target market? Let's stop the spray and pray stuff. It got you here. It got you to 100 grand. It's not going to get you to a million because consumers are pretty savvy. So we got to break it down in all aspects. And where do you think a million will be? So let's break it down revenue-wise. How many people would you have to have on? What kind of tools and resources in your business would you need? It, it sounds great, but you got to reverse engineer that dang thing. It's just like, you know, launching a podcast. Okay, 
you have to re I'm going to launch it on, you know, in 30 days. <laughs> I know you're going to die laughing. You're going 30 days. Yeah, I see you laughing. And it's like, there's a lot more to it. But that's the same way as I want a million dollars. You don't know what's all involved it, between here and there. And when you start reversing engineering it, you're going, okay, I'm going to launch my podcast in 90 days because that is something doable. It's the same thing with the million. They have to go for a longer time. So let's back up the bus a bit because I want to talk about that first time that you made a million dollars and kind of what Foley's were happening. Were you an overnight success? Did it take you 20 years to get to that overnight success? How kind of the whole story behind that? So let's start with how long did it take you to make your first million? It actually took a little over three years. Okay. In Seems like a reasonable business. half decent amount. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the plan I had uh, after my first business went pop with the tech bubble, I started the second one consulting with the companies that were still left and had money Makes sense. <laughs> and I started working with them, turning them around. And I started seeing, I need to duplicate myself really fast because I can only do so much consulting at once. Let's so, talk about a little bit of irony that you just made an innuendo towards. My first company went, I think I'm going to help them turn their company around and succeed. <laughs> yeah. which, which so many people, I think they get it wrong. They go, well, you have to have done it in order to be able to help me do it, which I don't think is true. I think that's a, a, a nice definition of a mentor. And I think that business is business. And I think that people are really emotionally involved with their businesses because it's their baby. And it's way easier to see things from the outside world than it is from the inside world while you're doing the thing. Because we get so attached to our baby and it's cute, oh, yeah. right? <laughs> It, yeah, it's cuddly and it, it grows up and it, it's keeping us up at night because it's crying and it's doing all these other things. And it grows up to be angry, angst-filled teenagers. <laughs> and the analogy works. <laughs> yeah, the analogy works, but you, you got it right. It's like, I knew business. Mm -hmm. And I actually knew their industry because I have my birth business in it. I'm just taking a different slant on it going, I know business. They know tech. I don't know jack about tech and I don't want to, but I, they have a business that they have to grow. They have venture capital money that they're accountable for. They have loans and debt out the wazoo. They got every credit card maxed. They don't know business. So that was like, I know business and I know that them, mm -hmm. there was my wedge in nice. and that's what I shot for. And I learned pretty quick. It's like word gets around in certain industries. And I had to learn how to duplicate myself quick. Well, I was just like every other business owner on the planet. You're not going to tell me how to do things. I know everything. <laughs> and hello to the dumbest person in the room. <laughs> Especially when you're dealing with tech companies. <laughs> tech companies. Yeah, all this stuff they talked about. I was like... Sure. And now they go, let's take a look at your PL. And they're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of airplanes going over here. Yeah, nobody it's knows where they land. Because <laughs> half of us didn't know what we were talking about. <laughs> That's kind of awesome, actually. Yeah. I wish you had some video of that. <laughs> that helicopter? <laughs> yeah. huh. Nice. But, so you're, you're working with these guys. So were, did you have that vision of, I'm going to make a million dollars in this business? Or... It was just kind of coming at you and you needed, it was necessity. Oh yeah. At first it was like, I didn't know where to, what to do. I was like really I was just beaten up. I mean, I had no motivation. I was, I had no confidence after my first business bust Aww. and getting the first client. I just started going through, you know, business cards, calling them up. Are you st basically, are you still, You're still in business? <laughs> There's a cold call. <laughs> that was the cold call. There, I'm just checking to see if you're still in business. I mean, I got 16 inches of stock certificates here that are worthless. <laughs> so that's how I started it. And they were like, well, they're dying. They don't know where to go, what, which way's up. So I was like a salvation to them. And I'm like, I got this because I know this part of it. 
I can really make a difference in their business. And after the first one, we started seeing some massive impact in their business right away. And then I started getting calls because I put out all those calls. They started coming in. Mm -hmm. And I realized I had to duplicate myself after I was trying to do it all myself. And then I tried to do three clients at once. And I realized I cannot, I'm not even, you know, I don't sleep to begin with, but not much. Now I'm not sleeping at all because I am nonstop working. And I'm like, this has got to stop. So well, and I would think too, from even from a consulting perspective, you got to understand kind of what the the client's business is and yeah. to be able to wrap your head around that and then to switch to another one and switch to another one, you kind of forget what the hell is going on the first and you're like, oh, what were they doing with that thing? <laughs> yeah, I used to call them red sheets and it was on red piece of paper, everything that their goals were. And it was in the front of binders, you know, because pre-files, yeah. you know, really a lot of electronic stuff. And I had to read that before I opened up anything else to get me shifting into the mindset of their company. Wow. And I'm like, uh, I met with a consultant. We were having coffee one time. And I'm like, well, you're successful. How'd you do it? And he goes, yeah, you have two choices. Just take on one to two clients, call it a day or duplicate yourself. I'm like, great. How do you do that? He goes, hiring someone just like you. So I'm thinking, he's a smart guy. So I thought I'd hire someone just like me. They're not like you. <laughs> no matter how much you beg them to be. And I hired wrong, just like business owners do. I got a warm body. They passed the mirror test. Yay me. And two weeks into it, I'm getting the client just nothing but call, you know, having fits. Mm -hmm. So I kept working with them and I didn't know enough to like get them along. And I went burned through a few people, unfortunately, and burned me. It was burning me out mm -hmm. hard. And I finally said, you know, enough's enough. I'm going to get help. So I actually knew someone who was a recruiter. I go, this is what I'm looking for. They're like, are you kidding me? We have like a million of people like that. I said, I just want this many right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm dying here. I, you know, money's coming in, but I'm wasting so much time, which is now my money. So my revenue wasn't but, and mental resources. Oh, I was burned out. You know, you know how you wear the same clothes like five days in a row. You don't even realize it. It was one of those. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I don't. <laughs> one, I'm a girl. Two, well, I'm just telling you. <laughs> Analogy, I'd never During happened. burnout, if you find yourself wearing the same clothes for five days in a row and not noticing, and somebody points that out to you, it may be a sign of burnout. <laughs> Maybe. <I'm saying. laughs> That's awesome. So yes. hiring people was hiring paramount. People. But then I learned, so I got the first person in from an agency, and I had to pay out the wazoo. You paid the price. Mm -hmm. And it was good, but not great. So then I had to start educating myself on how to hire better because I needed employees. Mm -hmm. And then I started realizing I need to get a ton of stuff off my plate. So I started hiring like there was no tomorrow. Bookkeepers, you know, uh, telephone service, all these kind of things that I was doing that was sucking the life out of me that on my, you know, sat Sunday night when I had those few hours. Once I started getting those things off my plate and learned how to hire right, I was now able to duplicate myself. So I started managing my business and leading it, not being managed by it. So I actually built it up to five other consultants. And I noticed I just said consultants. I didn't, didn't say anything about staff, like staff, staff. Didn't have any of that. I had someone answer an, an answering service for the phones big deal. It was minimal charge. I had a bookkeeper taking care of the books. Here's the receipts. Deal with it. Just give me the PL at the end of the month. Done. I had, well, at the time we had no mark. Oh, marketing was someone had to pick up a phone and call. So I found someone, can you call for one hour, you know, three to hours a week total? And here's the list. I'm giving you the scripts and the list. And that's all they did. So they're filling up my calendars again. 
And then I was like, oh my God, I got a business now. Now I got a business. My time dropped down to 40 hours a week. I <laughs> dropped down to 40 hours. I know that it dropped to 40 hours. <laughs> well, and they bust out in champagne for 15 minutes and said, get oh back to work. Oh my God. You know, the first <laughs> week, I had 40 hours. And I didn't work at night and all this stuff. The first week, I said, I'm going to go out. And, at the time I was married, let's go out and have a nice dinner and all this. And just lived it up. And then I woke up Saturday morning feeling guilty. Yeah, I told you, less than 15 minutes. What I do, what I do now. What I, do. <laughs> I got to get my fingers into something. And I did what every business owner does. Put your fingers back in the pie. And did some damage to the company, lost some consultants. And finally someone goes, you got to get your, you took your fingers out of the pie and you put it right back in. You destroyed the pie. You just built it. So I had to rebuild. So I went through the exact same process I did before, little, a lot smarter, I hope. And it started growing again. And it was like, great. But it's now at the end of the bubble, the entire bubble companies that were gone they're gone the companies that i was working with are just thriving and starting to make more money than they ever know what to do with and then all of a sudden i got approached it's like we're right at that million and we crossed right over the million and i started noticing i have a life all of a sudden i have a life did i go out and buy the lamborghini and all that and hell no you know why because i was war torn from the beginning so uh, to me, I put all my money back in my business and invested in better people than me, smarter people than me, better systems than I knew what to do with. Anything I can automate, get off my plate, I was going for it. And crossed over the million dollar mark and a company who has been wanting to buy my URL from my website for years finally came they were in Texas. They actually came out to Arizona, cornered me, and they said, where are the, where are the guys who have been wanting your URL? I'm like, really? And they go, we've been watching your company. We want your company. I'm like, nice. You know, I'm starting to love life here. Right. Really? They go, so I jokingly said, make me an offer. They just pulled an envelope out of it. <laughs> and I'm like, like they were a little ready for that. <laughs> It was like a movie thing, and the like, weight should slide it under the table, right? And the offer on it, I'm just looking at it, I'm like, can you do sharpen your pencil and do a little bit better? And they just looked at me like, they go, here, hold on. And they pull out the second envelope. It had the check in it. Oh. And well, I'm like, in that case. <laughs> I could transfer that URL here in just a few hours. <laughs> right and we could get the paperwork done here in a day or so and they okay. go no problem another guy wants a briefcase he had the contract they were that serious and i sold it right then and there and wow. i never dreamt of that it never even crossed my mind life i was just getting on the roll i'm thinking oh i cracked one million i'm ready to go to two and then i was thinking that was a hard to get to the million i mean it was hard but you know what? Hey, wait, to get to the two, it's on paper in front of me. So I just paid everyone out and walked away from it. Wow. And that's something I never thought I would do. And I, to this day, I, do I regret it? No, at the time, it was the right thing at the right moment. Because I, all that was going on through my head was, how hard was it to get to the million? I went through a lot of learning and curves and everything else, but it hit me like, if I get out of this, I can start something else and be better at it and get better because I can take this new experience and this new knowledge. And that's exactly what I did. So nice. I actually went and turned around a company to validate myself. <laughs> and then I'm like, okay, now to start company number three <laughs> just because i have low self-esteem i think i'll start another million dollars <laughs> that's kind of hilarious which i'm sure actually a lot of people actually do they just don't have the wherewithal to tell anybody that. i came into this company and they're just like 
battered. And I'm like, oh, yeah, you need a consultant. They're like, wait, aren't you a consultant? I'm like, yeah, I don't do that anymore. I sold my company. And, uh, and then they're like, well, why don't we just hire you as the CEO? <laughs> nice. I'm like, make me an offer. <laughs> right. Well, and I was talking to another um, awesome and epic business strategy kind of person. And he focuses on um, brokering businesses. So buying and selling, he goes, most people don't realize that it's so much easier on the other side of selling the business, because once you've sold the business, you've created your first um, kind of epic wealth state. It's kind of like selling your first house for more than it's worth or more than you paid, you know, 10x what you put into it. Then you have this epic amount of cash and now you get to do something awesome with your life. Like everything else before that was prep time to go. this moment, because now you've got, you know, a hundred, a million, whatever it might be, but it's a substantial amount of money that you now get to go and say, Hey, what do I want to do with this? And like, it's so true. And I, I think it's a, a genius idea. I wish I would have been smart enough to realize that back then, honestly, because, <laughs> you know, after the third company, it's like, I did too good. We sold them. Got them sold. <laughs> nice. So is that what you did with number two and number three? And uh, the company three I turned and... around, we ended up selling it. And then I started company number three. I ended up also buying a, re a, a retail store that was just deader than dead. I turned that around, won a whole bunch of awards. Economic downturn hit in 2008. And the it was a picture framing or custom picture framing shop. So it was all discretionary income. Economic downturn hits. But I re I know business, so I actually renegotiated all my vendor contracts before everything hit. So everyone else is going bankrupt and can't pay their rent. And here I am, I'm still you know, making money in this economy with discretionary income. That's <laughs> shot. And everyone's looking at me like, how in the heck are you doing it? And I go, I know business. I know marketing. I know operations. That's my jam. Well, I go, and I, I will really point out to the audience that that is two successful companies during two downturns. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> not during the upturns, not know, during yeah. the downturns. It, it, it's crazy because when I started thinking about it, everyone's coming to me now going, how are you doing this? How are you keeping the lights on? And then one day I'm like, you know, I'm getting burnt out because everyone's coming at me. I think I'm going to start another company, another <laughs> coaching and consulting company because <laughs> I got nothing else, right? And I started doing the math on my retail store and my lease was up and landlords like pressuring for my suite. But meanwhile, everything else is a ghost town around me because they all went bankrupt. I'm like, I'm the only guy paying you rent. Yeah. Why, Why was he you? hammering you? Yeah. To pay for their rents, I guess. So I'm like, thanks, Steve. You're smart enough. The parts of my business were greater than the whole. So I realized that once I did the math, and got unemotionally attached to it. Mm -hmm. And I started selling off all the pieces of the business, equipment, inventory, databases. I made more that way than what the business was worth in the economic downturn. And I walked away and I started the consulting company, working now with franchisees, turning them around. Nice. So I it was like, because they're locked into a contract. They're going to have to mortgage their house, put mm -hmm. two, three mortgages on their house because they got to pay that franchise, franchise work. And there's nothing that sucks more than just looking at your your savings being depleted, 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 like, and something's got to change. Something's got to change. Something's got to change. Oh, we got to spend a lot of money to figure out how to change it. It may or may not work. And <laughs> yes, it, it it's a horrible place to be. And you know, when they find somebody like you to be able to come in and go, oh, thank God, because it's oftentimes I have found, especially with franchisees, is they get a buyout and they go, oh, we're going to buy a business, which again comes back to that. I got an epic amount of money. Now I get to create something that's and they go for a turnkey business because they get that they're new at entrepreneurialness. Guess what? It's still entrepreneurialness. <laughs> you it can't is. Escape it. You're buying a system. You didn't buy a business. You bought a system. And I've owned two franchisees and I've worked with so many franchisees and I'm, cause I know you're not getting the support from the franchise or I've been there. Mm -hmm. One of my, that retail business, I was dying of death until I read all my contracts one weekend over and over and over. 
And then I started realizing I could do a lot more than they said I could. Monday morning, I walked in, stripped. I literally took their name off the inside of everything inside the store. Why? I could. Didn't say I had to have it in the agreement. I renegotiated my vendors. They sent me nast certified nasty grams. You can't do that. And I go, show me in the FTDs, the franchise disclosure documents. I can't. Never heard another word. I had complaints from all the other franchisees in the state. Why are you letting Steve do this? They go, he's not doing anything wrong. Because you can't sell them. Everything went to pot in the economy. I had better I had better deals with suppliers. I actually created co-ops with my competitors. So we get better pricing. I won an award from organization from entrepreneurial development because I lowered my cost of goods from 55% to eight because I looked at my numbers. I knew my numbers and renegotiated my contract. And I kid you not, it wasn't always pretty. I did have to get help in one of my businesses. I was I was that guy watching the bank account just go. And you can hear the sucking sound. And I couldn't do a thing about it. No matter what I tried, it was like I just put more acid on it. <laughs> you know? mm. And I finally, you know, sucked up my ego and got a coach. And in 45 days, life got really good after that. My life, my business. And since that point, I've always had a coach because <laughs> it changed my life. <laughs> Right. And 45 days is a pretty good turnaround. And it was a rough 45. I'm not going to say it was pretty. <laughs> okay. I had a coach kicking me in the front side, not the back. So we went through a ton of kind of what you did right, what you did wrong. If you were going to go into business again, I, I know you wouldn't probably pick a retail outlet. <laughs> but, uh, friends don't let friends own restaurants, flower shops. Or... Oh, yeah. Friends <laughs> don't let friends own restaurants. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, what advice would you give to somebody that's going, okay, I, I'm at my, let's call it 300,000, whatever. And all these numbers are random and they drive me nuts. Because if you sell 99 cent products, it's a lot harder to get to 300,000 than it is if you sell houses. Right. And realtors are infamous for going by the, the 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 price of the transaction of their deal. And it's like, yeah, that doesn't have anything to do with your income and or how much yeah. money you made off that deal. And or let, let me go on and on and on. Um, and I know people that run, you know, eight figure businesses and don't bring anything home. So you can't really talk about, you know, are you a, a six figure <laughs> business? When they're making a million dollars, but they're not bringing home, you know, more than the 30,000 minimum wage kind of thing. It's true. I work for the company, 73 million a year, losing 1 million a month. The oh. guy, the owner who has all the skin in it, second mortgage on the home, he's, dri he's driving a 40 year old Datsun because he can't afford anything else. He has the bankers coming in every day regarding his lease for his building. And he got help. We turned him around in eight months total. Got his all his mortgages paid off. He had lawsuits. We everything changed his whole world. And I realized a long time ago, the one thing I was missing when I had the problems, I asked for help and I got someone to help me, a coach, advisor, call whoever works the best for you. But you got to get someone who's not financially in your business. Like you got to pay them for their knowledge and resources, but they're not connected to your profits or your bottom line or whatever. Mm -hmm. They're and they help, they're on your side. Once I sucked up my ego and got that help, that is the number one thing. And I've talked to so many business owners and they go, the day I got a coach was the day everything changed. And it was for the better. All of a sudden, my life got better. I got to see my business without tight blinders on. I got to actually start managing my business and they taught me things I thought I knew. And I usually did know them. I just didn't have someone there holding my hand, holding me accountable to my own goals. That was the biggest lesson I've learned. And to this day, that's, I still, anytime I have a problem and I realize, do I have a coach? And I, I noticed at one point, even in this business, I had some struggles and I was like, 
why don't I have a coach right now? I went out and sought a coach that day and got recommendations, started interviewing coaches and brought on a coach as fast as possible. And all of a sudden, here we go again, back up. Nice. And, and I personally tell people, you know, ask more questions and you spend money. Because, you know, I spent money on coaches when, hey, I can help you do this. I went, oh, okay. Yeah, that was dumb. So yeah. <laughs> what's your process for going through coaches to figure out which one might actually be good for you? <laughs> I actually wrote a book on why you need a business coach. And it actually, <laughs> I put in there, I think, 12 questions. You should be asking whoever you're thinking about having as a coach. Me, whoever. Mm -hmm. Ask those questions. And I couldn't agree with you more. When I was interviewing coaches, I was grilling them because I learned the lesson the hard way of employees. This is basically someone you're paying to help you grow your business, just like an employee. Why not put them through a tough interview process? And guess what? I've kissed a few bad frogs in my day, but it was a learning lesson that I didn't ask enough questions. I didn't check them out. I didn't get referrals. I mean, I talk to my clients. I'm like, hey, I got someone who comes on. They would like to get a referral, a testimonial from you. They're like, I don't want anyone to know I have a coach. I'm like, why is that? And they go, everyone thinks I'm a miracle worker. I'm growing my, I was dying and now I'm growing. So they think I'm a miracle worker. I'm like, okay. Okay, <laughs> okay there's still some ego going on in there. The That'll... girlfriend you don't want to tell your friends about. Okay, I get it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, karma will, has its funny way of working that all. <laughs> it does. Ask so, questions. Not every coach is the right coach for you. Exactly. What are some of the things that that people should be asking about or inquiring of, about with a, the right coach? One thing that kills me is like, how can someone be a business coach if they've never owned or operated a business? That's going to be critical because for me, I know because I work with owner operators. That's my fave. That's where I love. That's my, that's where my passion lies. I know what it feels like to wake up at two in the morning in a cold sweat, worrying about payroll in 24 hours. I know that feeling. I know that feeling when you have to go have a renegotiating meeting tomorrow morning with the vendor and you can't sleep all night because scenarios are flooding your head. If someone has never been there, how can they coach you through that? And say, listen, breathe, it's going to be okay. And what to do and what to look for. And give you some scenarios, real scenarios, not stuff that they're Googling on the internet right now. It, you got to get some real stuff. And I think that's critical. The industry, it depends if they're an industry consultant. Like if you're in semiconductors and you need someone to help you with the manufacturing of semiconductors, you need to find someone who's specialized in that. I, mean, I work with someone who created chips. And they're like, well, what do you know about creating wafer chips? I go, it's not one dang thing, but I know business and I know you're losing money just by me walking around your business. And they go, how do you know this? I know business. I can tell you, you're bleeding money. And they're like, you haven't even looked at our books. I'm like, I don't have to. I could tell you you're dying because I know business. I don't need to know wafer manufacturing unless you want me to fix your clean room and then I'm not your guy. Yeah. And, and until we uh, get you enough money to fix that way for machine, it's not really an issue. <laughs> There's the helicopters again. <laughs> right. Uh, awesome. And it's so unbelievably true. And and I, I don't think you need a therapist in business, although they help. <clears throat> um, trust me, I brought therapy into my executive coaching more often than I can tell you about. But I think it's super important because if somebody hasn't been a, a, in business before and they don't understand that emotional attachment to it, they can say things that are super patronizing and super unhelpful, like, well, just don't worry about that. Let's go and do this. And it's like, uh, no, I'm not only worried about that. It's like the 2000 pound elephant behind it. Like, yeah, I'm worried about it. And his friends that are now stampeding through my house. So yeah, I'm going to worry about it. And and then that gets stopped and then you're not in a trust relationship with your coach anymore and yeah. and it's all for naught. And I think that is what causes a lot more problems than and any of them is the ones that either they haven't been in business before, they understand their kind of route, but they don't understand anything behind that and or they just don't, they've run businesses before, but they don't understand business. 
which I've also come across, which is rather bizarre because I don't think business personally is that difficult. It's like there's few components yeah. to it. <laughs> so you made a good point. They could have ran like a division for a company. So mm -hmm. they know that one sliver of the giant pie. They're good at that one sliver. They just don't know all the, all the other pieces of the pie, how it all related to them. And I see that I call it jumping the cubicle. You work for a widget factory. I can make a better widget. I'm going to go out on my own. I know how to make a better widget. You didn't realize the company you work for took care of accounting, marketing, sales, inventory, logistics, and it goes on and on. You don't know anything about that, but you're good at making a widget. So what do you end up doing? Working on the widget, no sales. Working on the widget, IRS is knocking at your door because you didn't fill out the paperwork. <laughs> and all those fun things. So let's talk about now, who do you love to serve and support? Who is your ideal client right now? Mine has been owner operator. And here's why, because I do know what they go through. And I've been in the C-levels and all that. My last company, I worked with primarily just C C CEOs. And I found my passion wasn't there because they're still a hired gun. They can only do so much. When I know I'm working with an owner operator, I know it's not just them. I know it's their family, their spouse, kids, whatever, but it's also community. It's hiring employees. It's being part of something bigger. And 97% of all the businesses in the U.S. are small business. So if I can help them survive and thrive and realize their goals and dreams, man, that's, that's where, my, where it is for me. And in a lot of businesses, you know, they're struggling at their, that quarter million, half million dollar mark. And they want to get to that million. It's like, great, that's one milestone, but let's get you to the, the half million. Cause getting the half million is going to be a lot different than that first hundred. Mm -hmm. Then three quarters is going to be a different. Then that last million, you're going to be like, why can't I get there? Right. Don't worry. I yelled that too. <laughs> well, second I think everybody company. does. <laughs> so <close. laughs> awesome. So, so give us a. I am. I am bringing you way over time. So first off, I'm going to check. <laughs> Do you have anything going on right now? And can I steal some more time from you? Awesome. So, uh, I would love to know. And you can pick the question. One, give me an example of a Cinderella story of one of your clients. Two. Uh, what are some of the stumbling blocks that somebody might have that they're going, oh my God, Steve, I need you so badly. Uh, give us either answer. Your preference. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, one of my Cinderella stories was a CPA. So he was doing about a quarter million a year. You think that's good, but when you do the math, he's broker than broke. So he was taking home actually 45,000 a year for working 80 hour a week. We started working with him and he was to the point like, I want more time. I need to hire the right people. And you know what? I got to start thinking of the end because he had no exit strategy. So it was like, we had to create the plan. We found out he didn't have the right people on his staff. We had to change that. I had to teach him how to hire right. We changed actually his focus of his business and started getting rid of the bad clients and brought in the good clients and did something that almost every small business owner doesn't do. And that's increase your prices because- he knows numbers, but did he ever look at the all his cost rising? He never increased his fee, so his margin was going down, and he can't figure out why he doesn't have any money. They're smart people. The reason is we're in our businesses. We don't see that unless someone goes, hey, breathe. Look at this. Do you notice this? And then also when you realize it, you're going, but I know that. Well, you're like every business owner on the planet. So that's where we changed him around. But he just got tired of being stuck. He never took a vacation. His wife was ready to divorce him. And it was just like he was in that terror situation, just know, doing what he knows and doing it over and over and thinking that's the right thing to do when he could have just you know, thought about it a little bit and worked a little smarter. And that's where we came in. Nice. So if you find yourself in that position, which I'm sure a lot of our listeners do, how do they start their journey with you? They can get a hold of me on well, my website, which is Biz Coach Steve. It's B I Z Coach Steve. Or my email is really hard. It's Steve at bizcoachsteve.com. <laughs> I, I know people will laugh because they're like, okay, where's the rest of it? Yeah. I like that. <laughs> Steve at Biz Coach 
steve.com right that's it awesome i love it steve you've been absolutely fabulous thank you so much for your time i know how valuable it is i appreciate being able to drag you on if you had any last words for our peeps that are looking to hit that seven figure mark what would you say you can't do it by yourself get help get the right help to get you that and that then create the plan create that plan of action take the action on it and i swear it, it can be done it can be done I love it. Steve, you are fabulous. Thank you again for your time and thank you for being here with us. Thanks for having me. Peeps, this is Michelle Nedelec. Thank you for being here with us today. Be sure to share this with your fellow entrepreneurs. We love helping you grow and we want to be there for you every step of the way. Thank you for listening to 7 to 8. If you're interested in upping your speaking game, be sure to connect with our guests with the links in the show notes and connect with me to see how we can help you get your tech done for you and help your speaking dreams come true.